You want me to put this on? Uh, yeah, put full screen. I think full it's screen. Better. Enter full screen. Okay. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the the chairman for inviting me for giving me this opportunity. So I decided to talk about some project in which I'm involved for uh, one year or so. And so I'm reporting the work that I did with João Rasga, Walter Carnielli from Campinas, and Jaime Ramos. So I'm going to talk about the decidability of logical decision problems and um, also uh, the decidability problems or combination of logics. So there are two pillars to the, the talk that I'm giving. The first one is David Wilder, who actually proposed several problems, several logical decision problems in the context of fall, namely the satisfiability problem, the validity problem, and the provability problem, all of them in first order logic. Uh, the other pillar of the things that I'm going to talk about is Alan Turing, as his notion of reduction. So Alan Turing was the first to define reduction over the natural numbers. And so his idea was that if we have two subsets of the natural numbers, we can say that C1 is reductible to C2, providing that the characteristic map of C1 is computable when you take as an oracle the, the characteristic map of C2. I'm not going to take this notion. I will take a more abstract notion than this one. But anyway, the, one of the roots of my work is here, precisely. So what are the main goals? The main goals, I could say that we had three in mind. The first one was to provide general conditions in which we can relate logical decision problems. So I have something about satisfiability and I want to conclude something about validity and things like that. The other is I want to understand better when I can reflect decidability. What does it mean? I know that something is decidable and now I have a reduction of some problem to that one and I want to know if the problem I started with is also decided. And uh, I'm also interested in the combination of logics. And of course, I will point out where combination appears in the things that I'm going to talk about. So the first thing that uh, we had to do was to present, uh, to adopt an abstract notion of reduction, but we had to extend it a bit. Because since we are dealing also with combination, we have the possibility of trying to reduce a problem, let's say decision problem from D to decision problems D1, Dn. So that's a generalization of the usual thing. Anyway, let me start by saying what is a decision problem in general. So assume that I take as my universe a certain W. I have a decision problem, which is a pair. The first component of the pair is the universe I'm adopting, which is W. And then I'm taking an A, which is a subset of W. And basically what I want to know is whether or not A is decidable in the context of W, okay? So uh, there are many ways in which you can prove decidability. As I said, I will concentrate only on reduction. So now assume that I have a problem D and I want to define a reduction of D to D1 and Dn, which are also decision problems. So what is a, a, a generalized restriction? is a tuple of maps, computable maps, tall one, to n, each one going being a map between the universes. So for each k, you have a map from w to wk, and I denote the reduction as you see here. And the thing that I have to prove is that if I pick up any w in the universe, it will be the case that w belongs to a if and only if the translation by uh, tall of k of w belongs to a k. And if, sorry, and if I meet this setting, then I can say that D is decidable, providing that I know that D1 and Dn are decidable. So this is what I call reflection, because you have the D1 and Dn on the right-hand side, you are, you are concluding something on the left-hand side for the decision problem D. So now let me uh, share with you what is the, uh, framework in which uh, we think that we, we should work. So since we are in logic, uh, we want to adopt a certain logical framework for understanding decidability via reduction. And basically, there are two kinds of problems. You have semantic problems and you have, uh, let's say, deductive problems. So if I want to tackle some decision problems which involve semantics, 
right environment for doing so is satisfaction systems. So what is a satisfaction system? It's a triple in which you have an L, which is the set of formula, formulas. Then you have a class of models, which I'm calling the N. And then you have a relation, a binary relation. And this relation states for each form and each model, whether or not the model satisfies the formula I picked up. Usually there are several uh, problems related with semantics. One is satisfiability over a satisfaction system S, which is the L set of formulas, and then the set of every formula that is satisfiable. That means that there is at least a model that satisfies the formula. Then I have, of course, the, the complementary problem, which I call co-satisfiability, which is precisely the complement in terms of the set that I want to pick up. I also have the validity problem of S, which is again the L set of formulas plus all the formulas that are valid. This means all the formulas that are satisfied by every possible model that you have in that. And you have once again the co-validity problem, which is precisely the problem about all the formulas that are not valid. Ooh, sorry, there was here something strange. So now let's uh, look a little bit. So a decision problem over a satisfaction system is always the language, that's, that's the L, and then a set, a subset of formulas gamma in general, okay? Uh, so here I state things that are very, sim very simple to prove, which is that if, we, that if you know that the decision problem L gamma is decidable, this happens if and only if, the complementary problem is decidable. This is very simple because if you know that the characteristic map of gamma is computable, so is the characteristic map of uh, the complement of uh, gamma in L. And of course, you have immediately two corollaries, which is satisfaction in SAT or satisfiability in SAT is decidable if and only if cost satisfiability in S is decidable, and the same for validity. Okay? So now I want to tackle another problem, which is I would like in some, in some cases, and I will provide an example very soon, about transfers of, uh, of, pro, of, decision, of decidability between validity and satisfiability problems, okay? And so assume that I have a satisfying system that I called S prime, and please note that I put the L in orange, because I'm not using an L prime, I'm using just an L. I will explain why. Then I have the class of models and the satisfaction, the relation. And I'm assuming that this satisfaction system has a standard negation, okay? What does it mean? It means two things. Two things. In first, the L prime is closed for negation. So if we have a formula, we always have the negation there. And there is also something related with satisfaction, which is, so if, you pick up a model and M prime satisfies phi. This is if and only if M prime does not satisfy the negation of phi. Please observe that in logic, there are many negations. You have classical negation, which appears, for example, in propositional logic, and you have intuitionistic logic, which is intuitionistic negation, which is different. And you even have the consistent negation, which is even different. So what is the intention now? The intention is the following. I can provide a condition that will tell me that if the, the validity problem of the validity problem of uh, S is decidable, providing that the, the satisfiability problem over S prime is decidable. For proving this thing, I need to state something else. Please observe that S and S prime have the same language, which is L. And I am also assuming that S prime has negation. Moreover, I'm assuming that there is a map that assigns to each model in M a subset of models in M prime. And moreover, I'm assuming that there is some kind of subjectivity in the sense that every possible model that I have in M prime is needed for the map. And if this happens, I can prove that M satisfies phi if and only if M prime satisfies phi for every M prime that belongs to the image by F of M. Okay, and now then with this, you can prove that satisfaction, uh, that decidability goes from satisfiability of S prime to the validity of S. And maybe you can ask, why do I need this? So consider, for example, model logic K. So when you have model logic K, actually you have two satisfaction systems that you can associate with model logic K. 
One is what people would call the local satisfaction system. So basically what you have is that when you provide satisfaction, you pick up a cryptic structure, which is a model in, in a model logic and the point. And you have to state when the script construction and the point satisfy the form. This is local because you can look at W as being a point in the structure that you have. And then you have another one, which is global satisfaction. And global satisfaction means that you just want to know when a formula is satisfied by a script construction. So you skip the point, so to speak. Okay. Moreover, you can say more is that whenever you say that you globally satisfy phi by this script structure, this means that there is local satisfiability for every W that you have in the set of worlds. And so in this case, what happens is that you can actually define a very simple map from the, 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 the global to the local by saying that when I do the image by F of a script structure, I have to put on the other side the same script structure with every possible element in W. So you fulfill the conditions that you have before. Moreover, the local satisfaction system of model logic A has negation. That is not the case with the global satisfaction system of model logic. And so you can infer that since this satisfaction system has, the, has a satisfiability a decision problem, which is decidable, so will be the validity over global model logic. So that's once. Now, another question is the following. Since we are logicians, we would like to discuss even the reduction of problems at the level of the satisfaction system, like the following. So if somehow I know how to relate the satisfaction systems, maybe that I could take some, uh, some um, direct results with respect to the reduction problems that I envisage. And actually, there is a notion which is very important to what follows. We, this notion is what is a reduction between satisfaction systems. So once again, I'm assuming that I have a satisfaction system, let's call it an S, and then I want to say something about reducing this satisfaction system to satisfaction systems S1, SF. What is this? So this is a huge tuple. So it's a tuple with the TOS, Gs, and an H, where you have the following, re uh, the following requirements. So each top K is a map from the formulas in L to the formulas in LK and should be a computable map. Then you should have maps GK that assign to each model of N a model in MK. And you, have, you should have some kind of preservation in the sense that if the formula phi is satisfied by M, then the image by GK of M should satisfy the translation of phi in K. And you should also have another map, which is a map that picks up a model in M1 and N and provides a model in M. And what you should have in this case is the following condition. So assume that M1 satisfies the translation of the formula by tau 1 and M M satisfies the translation of the formula by tau n. Then the, H, the model obtained by H to M1, M N, should satisfy phi. Okay, if you want to compare this notion with the well-known notion about what is a satisfaction system morphism, you see that it's not the same thing. But that should be expected since when you define satisfaction system morphisms, you are basically interested in preservation of satisfaction. It's not the same thing that I put right here. So the notion is due to by wise and you have here what it is. So there is a map again, going from L to L1. So I'm putting this by taking N equal to one because that's the definition of satisfaction system morphism. And in this case, you have a contravariant map going from M1 to N, and then you have what is usually called the satisfaction condition. And if you look of what we have in our definition for the case where N is equal to one, you see that this condition also appears here, but the other is different. But of course, this was expected since the purposes are different. Okay, the nice thing is that whenever you have a satisfaction system reduction, then you have nothing else to do because immediately you guarantee that you see if you pick up the, the maps on the languages, you get a reduction from the satisfaction, the satisfiability decision problem for S with respect to the satisfiability problems of S1, SM. And so, if these problems are decidable, so will be 
subtle this, okay? So what happens with validity problems? Do we have a similar, uh, a similar thing or not? So it's uh, a bit more complicated in the following sense, which is if I want to relate the validity problem for S with the validity problems for S1 and SN, we have to give something else. So besides requiring that there is a satisfaction system reduction, you should also say that G1 and GN and H are subjective up to satisfaction. And I explain what this means. This means the following. Assume that I pick up some model M, which is a model in S, okay? Then I should be able to find another model by doing, let's say, a, um, a two operation. First one is providing a model for each S1 and SN, and then using the H to find another model. And so what you are saying is that there is a model we, that is obtained by using the G1, GN, and H that will satisfy precisely the same formulas as M satisfies, okay? And there is a similar condition that you see here in orange, but what happens in the end is that if you have this further request here, you will also say that there is a reduction from the validity problem in S to the validity problem in S1, SM. And again, if these are, said, are decidable, so is val of S. So uh, it, this is interesting because I have here a picture of something that could be proved. So assume that I start with a particular satisfaction system of fall, which is a cyber, which is usually, usually called in the literature fall two, and then you can go through several reductions using the propositions that I gave before until you say that the validity problem for model logic K when you use model algebra is decided because you are able to relate this problem with the validity problem and you consider differentiated critical structures. So this is uh, basically um, what, what I have to say for the moment uh, with respect to semantic decision problems. Now, let's go towards uh, saying something about deductive decision problems. So the right environment for studying these ones are consequence systems. So consequence system was a notion that was introduced by Tarski in 56. And basically what is a, a consequence system is just a pair. You again have the language and then you have a consequence operator that associates to a set of formulas, the set of formulas that are consequences of that set. And this consequence operator has certain properties. So it is extensive, it is monotonic, and it is idempotent. So someone that knows topology immediately asks, is this a Kuratowski operator? No, unfortunately not always, because the closure of the empty set is usually not uh, the same as the empty set. And when you do the closure of the union, it's not always the case that it is the union of the closure. But anyway, it is an operator that every logician knows. So, in many, in many cases, you can say that uh, when you deal with the logic, generally you have a calculi, a calculus, an Hilbert calculus against some calculus, a natural deduction calculus, a tableau calculus, whatever. And of course, you can generate a consequence system out of a calculus. For example, assume that I have a calculus H for some logic. Of course, I can obtain a consequence system induced by this calculus by saying, that phi is a consequence of gamma whenever I'm able to derive phi from gamma in my Hilbert calculus. It is interesting because, of course, there are several uh, decision problems that you can, you can point out. Namely, you can also have consistency uh, consequence problems and so forth. But actually, each consequence system induces a family of consequence decision problems, which is this one. So for each gamma that you have in L, you can consider the corresponding consequence problem, which is a pair composed by the L and by the set of all consequences of gamma. So in the end, what you want to know is whether or not the set of consequences of gamma is decidable or not. A particular case is when you take gamma as being the empty set. This means that you are interested just in things that uh, do not need any assumptions, okay? And then you get what is called the theorem root problem. Okay, so now uh, I, I have here a first result, which is the following. So assume that I have a consequence system which has two properties. So it has the meta theorem of reduction and meta theorem of modulus. 
I put here a DAG because I will refer something about this afterwards. And what we can prove in this situation is the following. I can conclude that my consequence problem for gamma is decidable, when gamma is finite, providing that I have some psi, which is finite, but it is a subset of gamma. And I already know that the consequence problem for psi is decidable. So this means that you can start from a small set, so to speak, for which there is decidability and then go up, of course, not going through the finite sets. In particular, if you know that theorem problem is decidable, you can conclude that any consequence problem for any gamma finite is decidable as well. Please observe that uh, I'm not using the usual meta theorem of reduction. I'm using a generalization of it, which was given by blocking Pigozzi, which can accommodate even the global um, the global Hilbert calc for model logic, which is known not to have the usual MTD, but it has a special form of FTD, and so it is in the scope of this result. Christina, Christina, we are a bit out of time. Sorry. Okay, so um, <laughs> I have just, just a small thing. So I also have a notion of consequence reduction, which is not the usual notion, of course, of what is a consequence system morphism, because I have to add this, uh, this property over here. So I don't have the time to, to talk about it. So let me go. So let me put here something which we already proved, which is a series of things that are decidable. So I start with theorem wood in S4, which is decidable. Then I can use the Godel translations to, 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 to take the theorem wood in intuitionistic logic and is decidable because it's reducible to this one. Then I can take positive intuitionistic uh, theorem mood, and again I can reduce to the theorem mood over uh, intuitionistic logic, and it's again decidable. And here I even have uh, one of the first paraconsistent logics that appear, which is the N4 Nelson's logic, and this one is also reducible to uh, positive intuitionistic logic. And so the theorem mood of N4 is again decidable because the theorem mood of uh, positive intuitionistic logic is also decided. Okay, I have here uh, something related with the combination, with the meet combination. So I will only say the, the main result. So the validity problem for the meet combination is decidable whenever the validity problem for the two components are also decidable. So what is a combination of logic is when you put together two logics. There are many ways of doing it. it. In this case, I'm just considering meet, but I don't have the time. So. For example, you can put together model logic A and intuitionistic logic. Both of them are decidable. And so you get that the, the validity problem for the combination of these two is also decided. OK? So uh, we, are, we have two, let me say this. So we, we have a first paper about these things, which was published in the book of symbolic logic. And at the moment, we are uh, finalizing some work related to um, to, of course, uh, logical decision problems, but based on, um, on the deduction, let's say, on derivation, if you want. And uh, we tackled, as, as I said, meet combination. We want to tackle other combinations, namely fiber. Thank you so much. It was really unfair to give you just 15 minutes, I suppose, because there was a very nice bulk of results uh, to be seen. Uh, I will ask to see if somebody has any questions, although we don't have uh, much time. You could I'm put sorry about this. No problem, no problem, no problem. I think that uh, that this is not a problem. So uh, any questions from from the audience or from the from the panelists? I mean, I will ask a question because I think at least one question is deserves to, to be asked. There's, a, for, of course, a lot of things to be, be said here that there was no time. But I mean, did you decide, did you found any decidability that without the meat combinations that is more exotic of another logic that was not known to be decidable using these techniques or not? Or this was just out of curiosity. I mean, of certain I mean, logic... Some of the things that we found were not uh, no. in the literature. Of course, of course. Maybe there was none, but nobody said. That's yeah. very interesting. Okay. Okay, so thank you so much. Uh, I, think, I think this is a very impressive bulk of results that were here. Uh, so, so as I said, 15 minutes is really short for, for, for the panelists to show. This is most kind of a, a review of the things. 
So maybe thank just, you. Just by telling what to, I mean, we are not doing just this, but I mean, of course, Andre is also has a question. Andre. Yes, a very, very interesting uh, work. A uh, very nice talk. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to ask if you uh, looked at any uh, cases of uh, so-called uh, super intuitionistic logics. No, for the moment, no, because we were also interested in those uh, paraconsistent logics. And yeah, that, to that's say related. Something yeah. about them, and that was the reason why we decided to tackle and for or I mean Nelson's logic. Okay. But it's interesting. Your question is very interesting. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Christina. That Thank you for really the invitation. Good. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure to have you here and an honor as well. And now we are going to uh, Minho, to the north, to, to José uh, Espírito Santo. So, José, can you share your talk to us about Russell Profit's translation and atomic polymorphism? Thank you so much. So, you have the floor. Try to keep the 15 minutes. <laughs> if possible. Well, I think time dilates, right? <laughs> no problem with that. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Paulo. Thanks for the invitation to be to speak in this very nice meeting. Um, I'm presenting here joint work with uh, Gilda Ferreira. And uh, I tell right away that I'm giving an overview of these two papers. So so actually, I will start by the second one about uh, Russell Pravitz's translation. So this is about uh, translating intuitionistic uh, propositional logic into second order logic. So Russell told us how to encode this junction. And then Pravitz told us how to encode the proofs. And uh, we are now concerned about the translation of reduction steps. And um, at this level of reduction steps, uh, the translation does not work so well. And uh, this is um, a way of introducing the second topic, which is about atomization. So in particular about the atomic system F, atomic second order proposition, uh, intuitionistic logic. Uh, so there, there has been interest uh, about translations of intuitionistic logic into, into this fragment of system F, and in particular, we have here this uh, first reference, which will be uh, part of the second part of the talk. So we start with the Russell Pravitz embedding. Okay, so as I said, so we are interested in mapping to system F. So we have um, these uh, connectives of the implication, the universal quantification, and also we take as primitive the conjunction. Uh, we use proof terms, so here are some of them, the, the ones for the universal quantifier, for the introduction and for the elimination of the universal quantifier. So we have here instantiation with, uh, with type A. And the, the system is equipped with beta rules and eta rules for each uh, logical operation. So Russell, in the beginning of 19th century, explain how to encode this junction, uh, absurdity, also conjunction, in terms of second order logic. So we are just concerned in our work, just concerned about encoding of this junction and absurdity, but for this talk, just about this junction. So we'll forget about absurdity. Okay, this is the, the encoding. Then Pravitz in his uh, book uh, on natural deduction, kind of uh, show this encoding of the inference rules of uh, uh, this junction in, in, in the second order logic. So here, here is the, the, uh, the derivation of the introduction rule for, for this junction. Uh, so we have here a proof term that represents the, uh, the, the, uh, the sorry, uh, a proof uh, in, in system F that uh, of this disjunction with this junction de defined as before from a proof of some of, of a component of this disjunction. And the term is, uh, is here. So you see, you have do, two abstractions and then in the elimination part, no use of uh, the type instantiation. So elimination of the universal quantifier. For the derivation of the 
Uh, so there is here a typo. So derivation of uh, this junction elimination in, in F. So we, we, want, we want this rule. And uh, so there is a proof represented by this proof term that is given here. And here we make use of, uh, of universal elimination. Uh, so uh, we instantiate this um, term M, which is of universal type, because this disjunction is a universal type, with this C, okay? And then there is a pair that represents the arms of the case uh, expression. Okay, so this suggests uh, embedding of intuitionistic uh, propositional logic in system F. And since now we have these constructions in system F, we can uh, define the translation as if it were uh, homomorphic in all cases. Of course, it is homomorphic uh, for, for implication and, and conjunction. So uh, for these connectives, nothing interesting happens. The, the translation is trivial. So we'll concentrate on this on the, this, junk, this junction in the papers also on, we take care of bottom, not in this talk. So homomorphic translation of formulas and then or, homomorphic translation of proofs, given that we have defined already, sorry about this jumping, uh, already defined what is um, how to derive introduction and elimination of uh, this junction in system F. Okay, so, so we have already at level of formulas and at level of proofs, now the translation at level of reduction steps. So recall that in, uh, in IPC, we, so, so, okay, so I'm recording the full system here. So conjunction, implication, disjunction, and bottom are primitive. And uh, the, these constructions for disjunction are primitive. So that's represent introduction and elimination of disjunction. So this is formulas, proofs, and now reduction rules. So we have beta and eta rules, but since this junction is primitive. We also have commutative convergence for this junction and also for absurdity. And um, for uh, the commutative conversion for this junction has this, this uh, general form. So we have an elimination of a, this junction here in the, as a main, main premise of a further elimination. So this is represented in this compact notation using uh, contexts. Um, and so we will concentrate uh, only uh, afterwards in the, um, on the, the rules pertaining to this junction because the other connectives are, uh, are trivial, trivial, so conjunction and, and the implication and the absurdity we will ignore. So we concentrate on these rules, the beta and eta rules for the junction and the four, the commutative conversions uh, relative to this junction, one for each connective. And uh, so what happens at, the, at this level is Ruff, Russell Private's translation. So the translation does not work very, very well because uh, with the exception of the beta rule, all the other rules pertaining to this junction are not preserved by the translation. So here is an example. So the commutative conversion pertaining to this junction relative to the implication. So, so here the elimination is a uh, main premise of an elimination of an implication, okay? So this is the conversion. So the translation uh, gives us these two terms here in system F, but uh, and if I even expanded the, the case uh, construction here, and there is no, rela no relation uh, between these two terms by beta, eta, at least no obvious one. Okay, so, so this is the problem and this happens with all the other rules. So that we cannot, uh, we cannot, uh, we don't preserve the, the, the reduction rules of, of the source calculus. So this is, so this is our, uh, our excuse to now uh, uh, talk about atomization, atomization in system F as a means to solve this problem. Okay, so atomic, polymorphism. 
So there are two related solutions to this problem. One is instead of translating to full system F, just to translate to this atomic fragment. And the second solution is to equip system F with new conversions that do atomization. So we will see what this means. And these two solutions uh, are uh, related. So recall that what, what uh, atomic system F is. So in atomic system F, the elimination rule for the quantifier is restricted in this way. So we can only instantiate with an atomic formula, Y say. And the beta rule for the universal quantifier is restricted uh, accordingly. Okay, so now we want a new embedding uh, into uh, this system. So again, we will define it uh, in this uh, homomorphic way, say. So by defining now in system, in atomic system F, uh, uh, constructions for the introduction and the elimination of this junction. For the introduction of uh, uh, this junction, we can adopt the, the same construction as before because there was no use of uh, universal instantiation in this construction. But for the elimination, for the case, uh, we will be, uh, this will be necessarily different. Okay, this will be shown in uh, the next slide. Uh, note that uh, this is the embedding we are defining is not the, the one based on instantiation overflow that was also so the, due to Fernando Ferreira and studied by Fernando Ferreira and, and uh, Gilles de Ferreira. So what do we do? So in atomic system F, we want this rule holding for some construction here. And the construction now is defined by recursion on, the, on this formula C. Okay, and the definition is, is given here. So um, this junction elimination is uh, derivable in the atomic system F. And so we can uh, define a new translation just uh, as written here. Okay, so this was the first solution. Uh, I mean, uh, we will see why this is a solution, but this was the first approach to solve the problems with Russell private translation. The second approach, is atomization in full system F. So recall that we had this case expression here. And now we introduce atomic conversion, uh, atomization conversions. Okay. So if this, so if this C is atomic, so we let it as in here, there is no problem because it employs just atomic instantiation. But in the other cases, we introduce new reduction rules just to simplify the formula that appears here in this last position. And um, we, we can argue that uh, system F equipped with this new rule does not become inconsistent. So the equational theory has models. Okay. And now we start relating these two solutions. So now we have given a proof in a propositional intuitionistic logic we have two proofs in system F, with one being this fragment, the atomic fragment, and they are related by these atomization conversions, the conver um, uh, conversions that we just introduced. And this is uh, almost uh, immediate because notice that uh, we are in introducing conversions here that mimic the definition of uh, this case uh, expression in atomic system F of course, except for the atomic case. So just by this observation, this is immediate, okay? Not so immediate is that in fact, so not only there is this reduction, but the, the term in atomic system F is the row normal form of the russell private translation of proof M, okay? And for that, we, are not, we have to prove that this new uh, conversion is terminating and confluent. Okay, so this is the level of proofs, now the level of reduction steps. So as I said, 
for reduction rules related to implication and uh, conjunction, nothing happens, everything is trivial, we have this nice picture. But for the rules um, pertaining to this junction, we had before problems with the Russell Pravit translation, so let's see what's new. So for instance, so there is a slide here talking about the relation between atomization and commutative conversion. So before we didn't know how to connect these two proofs in, uh, in system F. But now since we have this atomization uh, conversion, they can be bridged in this very simple way. So first we do the atomization of this big case, and then just with a beta step, we get the other term. And this works for all the other commutative conversions. In particular, for the ones here in red, okay? And this is important. So the full picture is like this. So for a reduction step in a intuitionistic propositional logic, now Russell Privates delivers a simulation provided that we have the atomization conversions in system F. For the translation to system, to atomic system F, um, this is almost uh, like this in all cases, just with beta, eta, except these two red cases that, that are here, that did not work as a simulation, but just, so here we just have, for these cases, beta equality, okay? So, so, okay, so, for the translation to atomic system F, there is a kind of preservation that is weak for these two cases. For Pravitz, Russell Pravitz imb embedding, we have simulation in all cases, but the price is to add this new conversion, this new atomization conversion. Okay, so my last comments. So we have simulation by Russell Pravitz embedding, provided we have atomization conversions. And uh, so we can say something about the comparison between these two uh, translations. So, so what is the problem with the translation into atomic system F? The problem has to do with the timing of atomization. Okay, so the translation to atomic system F is the normal form for this atomization. So we do full atomization at compile time, so using a computer science language, okay, to get this term. And we have to stay in this system fully at, uh, atomized, if I can use this fraction, because this is the uh, atomic fragment. Whereas in full system F, if you have this extra conversion, we can use atomization um, with flexibility and uh, just employ it as needed to get the simulation, okay? And that's why we get the simulation in the end. So that's that's the the the, com, the co, uh, high level message for for us about the comparison between these two translations. The difference is in the timing and flexibility of atomization. Yeah. And and this is all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I think you kind of keeping track, more or less. So questions? Has any questions? Let me see more. I cannot see. So, so from the panelists. So, so this is actually very deep in the in your area of research that I don't uh, dominate. So, I actually have to read a bit of your paper to be able to to ask a question. So, I realize that Paolo Piston is also on the audience and he has a related work. So, can you actually tell us how this compares with his uh, work on naturality of of natural deduction, uh, is there any connections on, on the works uh, by Paul that is also here in the attendees or not? Or this is quite... Uh, no, no, that is, that is, that is a, a connection. So, so if I go back here, so we, we could employ just for the purpose of simulation, instead of atomization, we could employ this rule as, um, as the rule that we add to system F. Mm -hmm. And this rule would be enough for simulation, and it is a particular case of the conversions that Paolo and uh, Luca Trancini proposed to add to, to, to System F. Okay. So for the purpose of having a simulation, this is enough. They uh, um, 
are the more general conversion because they uh, care about this naturality aspect of, of the system. Okay, that's the connection. Okay, more questions. So thank you so much. I mean, it was really deep on Russell Pravitz embedding. Uh, if there's more questions, nobody's. Okay, Paul, thank you. The equivalence issue at the end. So there's a question and answer. Is, is, is it due to the fact that atomization conversion does not commute with ETA? So I think you can see the, the question. Yeah, thank you. The equivalence issue at the end. Is it due to the fact that the atomization conversion does not commute? Mm. I can't answer. Mm. This is complicated. <laughs> so thank you. I will think about it. Yeah. Okay, so I remove. It's not trivial. You see, Paul, Paul, it's not trivial for mathematicians to answer things. <laughs> Good. So I will ask now to Daniel to share his screen. So, Daniel, now we go from the north to Algarve, where now the weather is good. So, Daniel is going to show us something very nice that is characterization, also very nice, characterization of computational complexity classes using ordinary differential equations. Thank you so much, Daniel. To Ken, please, if you have now the, the poll for you, so you can talk now. So, first of all, I would like to thank uh... Paul, for inviting me for this special session. Um, this is joint work uh, that I'm discussing with a number of people, which will be referred to in the slides, like Olivier Bournet, Ricardo Godzi, Amory Poli. And here I'm going to talk about something a little bit more different, more related to um, computational complexity. Well, we all know that it's possible to characterize um, discrete computational models uh, using discrete computational models like the Turing machine where we are able to define complexity classes like P and P, P space and so on. Here I'm going to be interested in something a bit related but in a different approach. A big chunk of mathematics is continuous and well here what I will be interested in is knowing if continuous models of computation, can you somehow define a meaningful notion of complexity if you see these uh, continuous uh, systems as models of computation? And are you able to define classes of functions? And if yes, can you somehow relate these complexity classes that you obtain on the real numbers with the traditional ones? And here the emphasis is to try to obtain complexity classes over the reals, which feel somehow natural from the point of view of analysis. There are some notions that exist. There are several applications in control theory, in etc., where you can have a system, for example, when you have uh, here um, some initial input, real input x0, and you can, for example, accept or reject this input if you have some system that evolves according to some law until it reaches some accepting region, in the case where the input is accepted, or it might reach some rejecting region where the, the input is rejected. And you might think, well, it's not that difficult to define a notion of time complexity, of space complexity. For example, here I can say that the time you need to accept is well the time uh, here in the time variable that you need until you reach the accept region. Well, it makes quite a sense. And you, you might say, well, this is computable in polynomial time. If this time t accept is polynomial, for example, on the size or on the norm of x0. Actually, it seems quite natural, but it's much more complicated than this in continuous uh, models of computation because in discrete, basically for topological reasons. In discrete space, you can have, you can isolate with open sets points from the space. This does not happen in continuous space. You can stretch time, you can compress, and you can obtain things like this. For example, if you compose with an exponential function, well, you can exponentially accelerate the system. You might say, well, I'm somehow, um, using a trick, which is not acceptable to use the exponential, but here I have put the exponential explicitly. 
but in many different classes of continuous time systems, you can kind of obtain the exponential and even worse functions, for example, like the tangent, where you get everything can be accepted in constant time. And you can obtain quite easily using some tricks. And without, and if you don't pay attention, you can quite easily obtain this kind of acceleration, which is well known, for example, in the theory of hybrid systems and so on. It's called the so-called Zeno phenomenon, like, well, the Zeno phenomenon, which is well known in mathematics. And so we cannot simply use time as we are used to. Here, uh, I will be trying to characterize complexity and show how we can find some good notions of complexity in the sense that they are invariant. If I do this kind of speed up, well, I, this will not change my notion of time complexity. But I'm going to, at first to focus on a specific model, well, because it's easier to start with a toy example. And when you start to understand this uh, class, perhaps you can generalize to other classes. And it's basically systems which are defined by polynomial vector, vectorial ordinary differential equations. And why I use this kind of uh, model? Well, because it's mathematically simple to describe. You just have a polynomial, which has very nice properties. It's analytic fun. It's formed by analytic functions. The solutions will be unique and so on. There are many properties from a mathematical point of view, which make this model nice. And moreover, there is a realistic model for uh, implementation for this uh, model, which is a uh, Shannon's general purpose and all computer which can be implemented with, for example, analog electronics. And moreover, there is also a reason why we use this model, because our previous results that were obtained with uh, George Wish, Manuel Compagnol, that uh, this kind of system is enough already to obtain, to simulate any Turing machine. And in a sense, for those who are aware in computable analysis, at the computability level, this model is equivalent to Turing machines. And so if it is equivalent to Turing machines, which is, in my opinion, well, a bit a surprising result, if we obtain complexity notions and classes for this class of, uh, for this model, can we somehow relate with complexity classes for Turing machines? And as we will see, this is possible for several classes. I would also like to note that you mentioned the problems with time complexity, but for space complexity, the problem is the same. For example, you might say, well, if I want to see the space complexity here, I just have to see the magnitude of the simulation, uh, what is the bigger size that the solution can have. Well, here I'm representing one component, but you could have other components which go beyond one, which are orthogonal to this one. So there would be no problem. Recall that it's a vectorial differential equation. Um, so therefore, this is just one component. You can have other ones. But you can have bounded components, and even though you can go on for an infinite number of time, which is different from what happens in Turing machines, where you know that if you use a certain amount of space in time, which is exponential in this amount of space, well, you can say whether the input is accepted or not. Here, well, time can go to infinity and you still keep in this bounded region. So you cannot just use the magnitude of the, of the solutions as a notion of space. So you have, you have a problem even before starting showing equivalence results in defining proper notions of complexity, the equivalent to time complexity and the equivalent to space complexity. And well, we solve this uh, problem by noting that, for example, if you accelerate the system exponentially fast, as it's done here, you need, and if you have, for example, a polynomial system which accepts, you need to add a new component. And notice that here I've had the original polynomial component. I just add a new variable, and this is a linear equation, and multiply here. So you're just doing it seems nothing, but Actually, the solution of this system 
it's trivially the exponential and in this sense you exponentially accelerate the system so you can get this Zeno phenomena quite easily and here I'm showing with polynomial differential equations but this is happens in a series of uh, other models and here what we realize is that if you see all components like this one well we see that something grows very quickly there is some resource not only in time that grows and so we had the idea that you can instead of using the time you can use as a complexity measure the length of the solution curve and actually you should plot it more like this you can plot several uh, several axes you obtain just one curve even here if you have two and you can measure the length of the solution curve and if you use this notion of if you use the length well you can see that this is robust to this kind of speed ups it won't change the notion of complexity and actually you can characterize and this was an earlier result by uh, Olivier Bonnet myself and Amory Poli that we can characterize for example the class P you can characterize basically if you have some word you code it as a real and then after uh, you, you can have a solution that after a length which is polynomial on the size of the input this system has either to reject to reach the, ex, uh, the accept re accepting region or the rejecting region and if you have a language that has this property we call it polylink recognizable and we, sh we have shown that p is exactly the class of polylink recognizable languages except for example this kind of thing that can take a very long time until accepting this would be in another complexity class more recently uh, shown with Ricardo Godzi that we can characterize in the same way as time it seems well it's a simple extension from p it's not that simple because p proved this result it was a result very technical very specific to p we use a lot of properties of polynomials which are not necessarily true for um, exponential functions for example polynomials are closed for uh, and under composition exponential functions are not and this is a problem so we had to solve this uh, this problem and uh, to solve this first we need to characterize and, and this is an extension of this result we can not only decide languages but we can also characterize functions discrete functions computable in polynomial time and to do this first we need to compute functions uh, with polynomial differential equations, real functions. And here we have a picture which shows basically what happens. If we have a function f that we want, real function that we want it to be computable, we have the argument, we want an initial condition that depends in a simple function, typically a polynomial here on the argument. And then you have, which gives the initial condition of the system. And then you let the polynomial differential equation evolve and it should converge to f. It just gives the notion of computability. If you want complexity, you want that you can reach fx with a certain accuracy that depends on mu in a length that is polynomial on mu and well and on the size of the input. And in this sense we can characterize polylink computable functions over the reals and by encoding words with real numbers, well, we can encode or emulate a function over words with a function over reals. This diagram commutes. So we were able to show that a function belongs to FP if it is emulable by some polylink computable function. And using the res this result, we were able to uh, characterize P. For the exponential case, it's not easy as I mentioned because of problems like it's not close under composition but uh, we were able to solve this problem the idea is basically here instead of for polynomial we just put here a polynomial for exponential functions you would be tempted to use exponentials here but it doesn't work well, the idea that we had is that split the dependence of x and u 
and the dependence on mu continues to be poly uh, polynomial, while the dependence of the size of x now starts to be, for example, exponential if you want to characterize the class of functions computable in exponential time. And with this, you can also characterize x time. And this result is more general. It applies to several classes of functions. For example, we can characterize the Grisgorvik hierarchy. We have a problem that the Grisgorvik, uh, that here for this bound, for example, given polynomials or exponentials over the years, you can find extensions that you can use as a bound on resources to the reals. For the Grisgorvik hierarchy, for example, it's not that trivial, but using some tricks, you can do it. And in this sense, you can also obtain all the primitive recursive functions. And uh, also, so we get somehow time complexity. One might ask about space complexity. Well, we had one idea that, uh, that I mentioned here, not only, well, somehow the size or the amplitude of the solution seems to be useful as uh, space measure, but not enough. And one thing that it's important is usually that you can trade space by accuracy. And accuracy is a resource that you have to use. So we had the idea of using both accuracy and space. And we recently got a result which characterizes P space. And basically, it works like the other notion. For example, until you reach a certain region, you accept if you reach a certain region and then the solution stays there, you reject similarly. So basically it's this uh, notion. We have here a notion of bounded space. This is a general uh, definition. Here you have, it would be a polynomial bound. And here it depends on how efficient the coding is from the integers or over words to the reals. You have some encodings which are more efficient, others which are less. You want to we would like to have this characterization to be independent of the efficiency of the code. So that's why we put this G. And then we have here a notion of robustness to perturbation. So I'm just giving a brief review for lack of time, but the solution will be composed with the, of the polynomial differential equations on two parts. One part which works like master variables that works like a configuration in three machines. You just need to know the values of these functions of these uh, variables, and you are able to simulate the Turing machine. These are like auxiliary variables. And you have the robustness to perturbations that if some variable here signals Z1, signals that it's bigger than one, it signals, well, you can stop the computation, you can store the value of these variables, and actually you can store it with some error, which is fixed. And if you restart the computation, like in a Turing machine from not the exact value, but from the approximate value, you continue to decide exactly the same thing. You have some notion that says about that robustness that you can sample well uh, in a common way. And moreover, that you can repeat this procedure over and over without problems. And we, we have shown that under these characterizations that I've briefly discussed here, we can show that a language belongs to P space if and only if it is decided in polynomial space, well, here in this sense, where this bound is uh, polynomial. And so we have just submitted this result. And so I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That's really impressive. So the connections between differential equations and complexity. Questions? So I'd like to say that the previous student of Daniel Grasse won the Ackerman Prize uh, because of this and the publication on Journal of ACM of the characterization, I think, of P. So this is really an interesting result. And Andre, do you have any questions? No? Okay, so I will ask one question before Andre entering, is the following. Um, you characterize P X space and P space, and about lower complexity like log space and things like that. You have not tried, and by the way, separating P from P space would be already something very cool, right? Do you, because I also don't see any characterization of the non deterministic kind of classes like NP and uh, NX time, things like that. 
do you expect, now that you have PNP space, do you expect to use differential equations to separate them? That will be very cool. Or, or do you have any ideas for the non-deterministic classes? Uh, well, these are very uh, interesting questions and I think they make all the sense. Of course, they are all awards of very big prizes if they are answered. <laughs> yes. So <laughs> I, I don't expect this... Uh, well, perhaps one might use differential equations. I'm not sure at this point, but uh, well, I'm somehow convinced with all the work that has been in complexity that this won't be a, well, an easy way of doing it. Perhaps, who knows, but uh, probably you will have to use several tricks. And concerning NP, well, we had some ideas, but they seemed a bit artificial. And anyway, it seems more natural, at least in the first uh, stage, to characterize the complexity class, which are somehow further away, like P and X time, and then going down to P space. And NP would be a nice uh, way to go. And, and so probably a next stage and lower classes. But for now, well, we, we, the idea is basically gain a better understanding of what works, what does not work, which approach you have to take and perhaps refine them to characterize other complexity classes. Okay, thanks. Because I mean, I, I, I did have I did have a question. Um, so uh, for both for P and P space, of course, are closed under complementation. Uh, how important is that for your methods? Uh, well, complementation it's not uh, exactly uh, very very uh, at least directly important. The idea here is basically to simulate Turing machines and try to emulate the amount of resources on Turing machines trying to emulate with differential equations. So we use a more computational approach, let's say. Okay, thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Daniel. I will now give the stage to Andres Sedrov, the main speaker, that's going to talk about adventures on Lambic calculus. So Andre, can you share the screen or? So okay. Uh, I think uh, um, maybe um, um, if other folks can stop sharing the screen, then I'll be able. No, to nobody's do. sharing anymore. So now mm. nobody's sharing. So now it's just share screen and choose. If you want to give me the talk, I can share myself and, and go uh, on. Me, uh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Share. Okay. Okay. Great. How's that? Okay. I think so. For our side, as far as you can turn the, the pages, right? Yeah. We can. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, okay. So uh, uh, we will uh, um, get to the talk in a moment, but uh, I really wanted to take um, a minute or so at the beginning and um mentioned that uh, i would very much like to dedicate this talk to the memory of uh, my um late uh, old friend uh, amilkar uh, sernadash uh, and who is unfortunately no longer with us he has contributed so much to logic and computation in portugal um and the world that i thought it was very appropriate to to do that at this point um on on my several visits to uh, Lisbon, uh, Amilcar was uh, such a perfect host, and uh, we remember many good times we shared with him and with Christina. And uh, uh, I'm really sorry he cannot be here today. Um, I would like to talk about uh, Lambic calculus, and uh, this is the work that I've been doing uh, for the past maybe five or six years with uh, Max Kanovich and uh, from London and Stepan Kuznetsov from Moscow. Um, so uh, let's do, uh, uh, start from the algebraic side this time, okay? So just uh, let's start with a simple example. So this is an algebra of formal languages uh, built on a finite alphabet sigma and by sigma plus, we will denote the set of all non-empty words over sigma. Uh, and then we'll consider uh, the set of all formal languages over sigma without the empty word. 
Okay, now there's several interesting algebraic operations on this. Uh, multiplication, which is simply um, uh, a set of concatenations. Um, left division, um, so uh, of all those non-empty words U, such that for every word V in A, V followed by U, so concatenated by U is in B. And similarly, the right division. And then you, we have uh, uh, traditional operations of um, uh, union and intersection. Okay. Uh, of course, the two divisions are very interesting and they are connected to the product in the following way. The B is included in A under C, if and only if A times B is included in C. And this is if and only if A is included in C over B. Um, another example I want to look at is relational algebras. Um, so let's look at algebras of binary relations. Um, this time uh, I'll take a non-empty set W, fix a transitive, for some technical reasons, transitive binary relation U, uh, which we'll call the universal. And now if we look at all the sub uh, relations of U, there are very similar algebraic operations, okay? So at this time, multiplication is just simply composition of relations. Uh, left division, uh, we discussed last time. So this time let, let's uh, do a right division. So S over R is um, relates X and Y, uh, if and only if whenever Y is related to Z in R, then X, then X is related to Z in S, okay? And again, of course, we have two standard operations of union and intersection. And again, we have the same relationship. Uh, S is as before. S is included in R on the T, if and only if R times S is included in T, and if and only if R is included is in T over S. So of course, these are just but two basic examples of an algebraic structure that's called a residuated lattice. Um, I, th this is a very old subject. It goes back at least to Krull in uh, 1920s, in the um, uh, abstract algebraic uh, 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 research on uh, rings and uh, ideals in rings. Um, there is a wonderful paper from 1940 by Ward and Dilworth on residuated lattices in American math society. Um, so you basically have uh, a partial order which forms a lattice. Uh, with lattice join and meets, and you have a semigroup that uh, relates to this structure, okay? How? Exactly by this law that we uh, just noticed in the uh, two basic examples. B is below A over C, if and only if A times B is below C, if and only if A is below C over B, okay? So now, residuated lattices, kind of give algebraic semantics to substructural logics in the same way that hiding algebras give uh, algebraic semantics for intuitionistic logic. And uh, I can uh, recommend a wonderful book by Galatosh, Gibson, Kowalski, and Ono on residuated lattices. Um, and so from this point of view, what we are going to be doing is the logic of residuated lattices. Okay, what is this? Exactly the multiplicative additive lambda calculus. So what is it? So here's the rules. Christina mentioned that, uh, you know, in some ways consequence relation can be introduced semantically, which we just did, or syntactically in terms of a calculus, here's the calculus. Um, and this is this uh, uh, pretty much, uh, you know, traditional uh, sequent cal style calculus against and, and et cetera. Uh, except that here, um, there are two issues. Uh, one is that to the uh, left of turnstile, you have a finite list, okay? Not a set, like in intuitionistic or classical logic, not a multiset, like in linear logic, but a list, so the order matters, okay? And the other important thing is that for the um, right side rules for division, uh, it is assumed that this context pi is not empty, okay? And uh, 
we will, that, that's how it is in Lambeck, and we will discuss, hopefully, we'll have time to discuss later in the talk of what was the original motivation for this, but uh, uh, from, if you can just run your uh, uh, semantics of the first example, right, of the formal languages, we chose non-empty words, so that's where this comes from, okay, from, from, from your experience. Other than that, you have standards uh, against and rules for uh, disjunction conjunction. All right. So uh, the first thing uh, is that the cut rule is admissible. Okay. Uh, in other words, if you can prove something by using cut, then you can prove without cut. Uh, algebraic models of this calculus are residual lattices, and the sequence are the sequence is interpreted as the multiplication on the left sitting below in the lattice order. Uh, the formula uh, interpretation of the formula on the right. Okay. In particular. For the residual lattices, residuated lattices uh, of our first two examples, the language models and relational models, I'm going to be called them formal languages models and L models and relational models, briefly R models. Okay. Of course, the modern view of all this is that this is simply non-commutative intuitionistic linear logic. And this was uh, discussed uh, in the 1990s by Abrushi. Okay, the relationship between the two. Okay. All right. Now, um, the interesting aspect of this, this is so-called categorical grammars. The original motivation for uh, Lambic calculus is its usage for describing natural language syntax. Uh, this is a famous paper of, uh, of Lambic in 1958. I do want to say that Lambic was originally an algebraist, ring theorist, so he was very well versed in in his uh, uh, ring theory, uh, theory of ideals, residuated lattices, it's not a strange thing that he proposed this calculus this way. Okay. Um, formally, this is used, this is connected to uh, L models that we just discussed uh, in the following way. So for each letter, the grammar associates one or more syntactic types, which are formulas of lambda calculus. And then a word is considered grammatically correct if the corresponding sequent is a derivable. So the, the first basic example, which you can do on your uh, uh, napkin, is that the, uh, the John loves Mary is a grammatically correct sentence, and the corresponding uh, sequent in the Lambic calculus is, and so noun phrase John, uh, loves uh, Mary, it, it has this uh, formula, and then S is intended to be a sentence. Okay. So and this is a pretty bold kind of thing, right? I mean, that uh, in natural language, a phrase or a sentence is grammatically correct if and only if it's derivable in some lot, the, the corresponding formula is derivable in some logical calculus. Amazing. Okay. So there are, uh, so, you know, so. Adventures, the title of the talk is Adventures in Lambda Calculus, okay? So the first adventure is distributivity. Of course, both L models and R models, as you've already checked, right, are, as lattices are distributed, okay? Uh, however, there are very interesting examples of uh, residual lattices that are non-distributed, okay? And therefore, the distributivity law written like this is not derivable in the Lambda Calculus, okay? Uh, and this prevents the lambda calculus from being either L complete or R complete. Okay. So, uh, however, I want to point out uh, maybe uh, four years ago, there was a very interesting work of Christian Worm, uh, which, who, who provides a non distributive modification of L models, still L models, but modified in a very clever way to avoid this problem and therefore gains completeness. So, I can recommend this this paper very um, uh, very highly. Okay, now there are a number of known partial completeness results. Okay, so look at this uh, L conjunction, which is the uh, calculus without the disjunction. Okay, is known to be R complete. So complete in the relation model. This is the work of Andreka and Mikulas from 1994. Uh, it's known that uh, the calculus without disjunction and conjunction, so just purely multiplicative version, is uh, L-complete, as a spectacular work of Pentus, 1995. Um, uh, calculus 
uh, with only three connectives, the two divisions and conjunction, is known to be L-complete. This is a very, very nice work of Bushkovsky in 1982. And so here we come to our first open question. Is the calculus without this junction L-complete? Okay, not known. Uh, it is also unknown whether adding distributivity as an extra axiom yields completeness with respect to some kind of natural model. Not known, okay? Now, our first adventure is that we have noticed that the situation with the disjunctive version, that is to say the calculus without the conjunction, is different from the situation with the conjunctive version, which is the calculus without the disjunction. Okay, uh, here is how you can express distributivity without ever mentioning conjunction. Okay, so the following very strange sequence is not, that's theorem. The following very strange sequence is not derivable in the calculus without the conjunction, but it can be derived using the distributive calculus and cut. And therefore, the uh, calculus without the disjunction is neither L-complete nor R-complete because L and R models are distributed. Okay, so this is, this is the opposite from this known in, uh, uh, for the, the calculus uh, without the uh, disjunction. All right, now, uh, of course, I have no time to uh, tell you how we came up with the sequence, but the point is that this is uh, based on the so-called diamond property, which was noticed already by Lambeck and later used by Pentus which kind of allows simulation of conjunction in distributive lattices um, if you already know the join, okay? So you don't get the exact meat, but you get something that behaves very well like the meat. And uh, this yields you using cut derivability of our sequence in the presence of distributivity, okay? And so, so th this is how we constructed this, this sequence is by using the diamond property, okay? And the, the construction of the simulated meat by, uh, by using the diamond property. Okay, so that's the positive part of the theorem. What about the negative part? Um, this does not come automatically from the non-derivability of the distributive uh, law because we're just dealing with a simulation. We don't get exact conjunction. We get something stronger than that. Um, however, fortunately for us, derivability problem in this calculus is decidable. So we can just use some software, which was already developed, for instance, by Gibson, available online, which in this case gives the answer in several seconds. Um, in our uh, paper in Wallach 2019 and the subsequent uh, journal paper in information computation, we also do manual proof search, okay? Um, now, if you wanna be um, uh, uh, more adventurous, you can also construct an algebraic counter model which at the end is shorter, but it does require some creativity, okay? And the uh, amusing thing is that this kind of continues to work for both uh, linear, that is to say commutative, and affine generalization. That is, if you add the permutation rule, okay, which now allows you to permute all the things on the left, then you get intuitionistic linear logic. Um, and this same example still works, uh, the theorem is still the same. Uh, if we additionally add the weakening structural rule, this will give the multiplicative additive fragment of intuitionistic affine logic. And in that case, the sequence needs to be slightly modified, but again, you get the same kind of theorem. Okay. All right, so that was our first adventure. Now, our second adventure is uh, systems with the unit. Okay, so in intuitionistic linear logic, the unit constant, which is the multiplicative truth, is axiomized in the following traditional way. And observe, of course, that now the antecedent non-emptiness restriction is out of the window. And so we need to move from a semi-group to monoid, okay? So in particular, we now need to modify the definition of L models 
by allowing the empty word in languages. And therefore, we also need to uh, consequently modify the, the definitions of divisions, okay? Using the same formulas, but those formulas now mean the same because we are allowing the, the empty word, okay? And uh, you can quickly make a calculation that this unit constant, multiplicative unit constant is necessarily interpreted in L models as the singleton empty word. And this is because you have to have this thing be, tr be true in these models. A times one has to yield A for any formula A, okay? Now, axiomatizing the unit as multiplicative truth yields incomplete systems. For example, the following formula is true in all L models, but it's not derivable in non-commutative linear logic. Okay. So what we'll do is we'll present a kind of a minimal system called L plus empty based only on left division, conjunction, and one. There are no other connectives. Okay, so this is miniature, okay, which uh, captures the following principles which are correct in uh, L models. So A times one is equal to one times A, which is commuting, and one times one is equal to one. Okay. I repeat, this is going to be in the language that allows only left division, conjunction, and one. Okay, and so we write our minimal calculus in this way. So the first couple of things are just standard, right? Please. Notice there's no non-emptiness condition anymore here. And now, we have these two rules that correspond to those algebraic properties uh, that I uh, discussed earlier and which are true in L models, okay? And out comes the next adventure. Theorem, any system which includes this calculus and is sound in L models is undecidable, okay? In particular, the, so is the set of all L true sequence. However, notice carefully for this set, we do not even know whether the set is recursively enumerable. Okay. So again, no time, but I can, at least I can give you a, a sketch of the proof. We're going to encode two counter machines. Okay. Uh, from computations to derivations, uh, we have to construct the corresponding proofs in this small calculus. And the backwards direction from derivations to computation uh, um, is, is very nice. Uh, 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 it's totally semantic. It's actually a good exercise in L models, okay? Um, let me not go through the too, man too many details, except that I want to do, I want to notice this following thing. This whole encoding is based on pseudo double negation, okay? So F under B, under B, okay? And uh, this makes uh, the encoding possible. And this is what uh, makes it possible for us to land in that miniature fragment that uh, uses only left uh, division and conjunction and one, okay? Now, of course, uh, here you see shorthand with multiplication, but officially there's no multiplication because after you work all this out, then these multiplications in the pseudo double negation are transformed into nested left uh, divisions. Okay. Uh, and then we have to prove the corresponding lemmas that uh, every terminated computation can be encoded in a, in a proof. And uh, uh, going backwards, very cleverly chosen interpretation in L models, which uh, now uh, allows us to show that, uh, in fact, a proof can be interpreted as a computation in, in Minsky machines, okay? Now, here's an interesting twist to this, okay? Uh, I looked at all the languages so far, and my semantics was in L models, but why don't we restrict the class of languages, okay? So uh, we'll look at uh, regular languages only. So this is, uh, please recall, it's the minimal class of languages that includes the empty, a singleton, empty set, singleton empty word, and singletons A for any other symbol in uh, sigma in the alphabet, okay? And it has to be closed under language multiplication, union, and also iteration. So, 
And this is the famous clean star, right? So you iterate once, the product, triple product, quadruple product, etc. Okay. Um, and now the specific class of L models, in this case, which will include only models in which all languages are regular in the sense defined above there. Such models we will call L regular models. Okay, now you have to check, you have to check that this definition is consistent. And this is because the class of regular uh, languages is closed under Lambic operations. So multiplication, division, union, intersection. Okay. Now, it's known, it's known that without the unit constant, the calculus on the fragment of left and right division and conjunction is complete with respect to L regular models. Okay. This follows from the work of Bushkovsky and Sorokin. Okay, so uh, we will add one, but we will take away the right division. Okay, and the situation changes completely if we add the uh, if we add the one. Okay, unit. Uh, of course, we consider theories in the language with the unit constant, and now what the encoding of the Minsky machine that we just discussed shows is that the theory of all L models in this miniature language is sigma zero one hard. Okay, I remind you that we do not claim that it belongs to sigma zero one. It may be harder. It's an interesting open problem. Okay. Now, on the other hand, um, and this is rather subtle. Um, the uh, theory of the subclass of L regular models belongs to pi zero one. Okay, why is that? Uh, first of all, we have to quantify over regular languages, that is over regular expressions. And this yields an arithmetical universal quantifier. So we got at least one arithmetical universal quantifiers. Okay, but why just one? Why only one? Because Everything, when you unpack this definition, everything under this quantifier is decidable. It's Boolean and decidable. So you really just get pi zero one, okay? But look, for all L models, we had sigma zero one hard. For L regular models, it sits inside pi zero one, okay? So we were just discussing at the beginning in our uh, informal discussion, who is teaching computability theory, right? So, so this is this is you know right there. Okay, so uh, since no stigma zero hard language can belong to pi zero one, we get the following very beautiful theorem that the theories of L models and of L regular models in the small language already of uh, left division, conjunction, and one are distinct. Okay. And not only that, but the, from the proof of encoding of Minsky machines, we can actually have a sharper version. We can find a sequence of the specific form so that A, we can construct an L model such that the sequence is not valid in the model, but the sequence is valid in all L regular models. Okay? So this was the um, uh, adventure number two. I just briefly want to mention the known complexity results and I want to contrast commutative case, that is to say linear logic from the Lambic calculus, the, the non-commutative case, okay? So with only one implicate, well, okay. So in the commutative case, the left division and right division coincide. And then uh, this is a uh, you know, famous work of Kanovich from 1992 that you get NP completeness, okay, for proposition. Okay. In the case of a uh, Lambic calculus, a non commutative case, they don't coincide. So if you just pick one division, that is, as we did, left division, uh, Savatev showed that this is in P, poly time. Okay. Um, if you add for a uh, commutative, if you add a conjunction now, this is P space complete, either for conjunction or disjunction. This follows from my own work from 1990 with uh, Lincoln and uh, Mitchell and Shankar. Uh, th there is a, uh, if, 
if you just ask aloud these two uh, uh, connectives or correspondingly only these two connectives, you still get p space completeness even in a non commutative case. Um, all right, uh, so this is uh work that there's another paper that we had in uh Wallach 2019 we are currently writing a journal version of this and uh of course we you get p space completeness if you allow all the connectives the point is that you get p space completeness if you just add conjunction or you add just this junction to this one division with which this the system is a polynomial time design um, and by the way, we know how to make versions of these results that have only one propositional variables involved. Okay, no, no, no more. All right. Um, I don't have much time left, but I wanted to mention a little bit about the work we did more recently, the three of us with Vivek Nigam, um, and that's about so-called soft sub-exponentials. Um, it's a chapter in logical frameworks which are uh, used as specifications of deductive systems, logic and operational semantics. Um, as we speak, there is a special session going on at Cade about logical frameworks, but you know, that's such as like. Um, so in particular, we're interested in linear logical frameworks, which specify state conscious systems. Uh, here on the, with the sequence, so on the uh, left, we have two parts. One is the part which is unbounded formulas, we interpret it as a finite set of formulas. And then uh, the, on the other side of the stoop is the so-called linear formulas, which are interpreted as multi-set of formulas. And on the right, of course, you have just a single formula, which is intuition exists. Okay. So uh, several extensions have been already discussed uh, of this uh, for uh, one is sub exponentials through the work of Nigam, Olarte, Pimentel, and uh, Rice, um, which allow many, so many, finitely many unbounded and linear contexts on the left. And this greatly extends expressiveness. You can specify systems with several contexts, logics, concurrent programming, et cetera. Uh, there is independently a very interesting work of Fennig and his students, Simmons and uh, Polakov, uh, so-called ordered logics, okay? So he says, you're gonna add another stoop and there will be a third part here and these are lists, okay? So you get intuitionistic, linear, and Lambeck, or, or as Frank Fenning calls it, ordered logics, in the under the same roof, okay? And this uh, even more extends the expressiveness. Now we can express programming language evaluation strategies, system lists, et cetera, okay? So what we did in this work it was to have a logical framework with both commutative and non-commutative sub-exponentials. Okay, so you know this is this is this wonderful thing. I guess was discovered by Nigam and, and Dale Miller uh, in uh, 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 Vivek's thesis is uh, that you can use the fact that exponentials, as they are defined in linear logic, are not canonical. In other words. You can have your underlying multiplicative additive linear logic, and then you add exponentials with usual exponential rule in red color, and then you write them again in blue color, and you cannot prove that the red is equivalent to blue. Okay? And at first this seems crazy, but then it turns out through the work of the, you know, Vivek Pimentel, Alarte, and, and others, that this is actually a good thing, okay? That you can use these things to express. So, for instance, I, I think it's still being discussed. I, I, I would say this is still an open problem. If you take multiplicative linear logic, no additives, and add exponential, that uh, it's not known whether this is decidable or not. Okay. Uh, now, if you add two exponentials to multiplicative linear logic, then... Um, Kastav Chaudhary showed that this is undecidable, okay? So it actually demonstrably adds power, okay? So this is what we're gonna do. There are many details here. I'm uh, almost running out of time. Um, we're now going to use these exponentials to try to deal with the following kind of things from 
um, linguistics that, that the lambic calculus has trouble with, okay? So look at the sentence. John signed the paper without reading it, okay? And then you make the phrase. Uh, the paper that John signed without reading. Ah, what did John sign? The paper. It goes there. Without reading what? The paper. Okay, so you see there's duplication here and you have to deal with uh, something that allows contraction in order to do this duplication. And this is why um, linguists uh, such as uh, Glenn Morrill and, and his students, uh, Oriol Valentin in Barcelona, they are the gurus on this. They, they said, well, no, no, we're going to deal, we're going to deal with this problem by allowing uh, judicious use of the sub-exponentials, okay? And now with using the sub-exponential, you can uh, make a derivation, okay? So we had a paper in each car in 18 that, that, that looked at that, and uh, that was wonderful. However, however, uh, the, uh, the trouble, trouble uh, around the corner, okay? Uh, in our paper, which just appeared last year in uh, Journal of Logic and Computations, we showed that this framework does not satisfy Lambeck's non-emptiness property, which we discussed earlier in this talk. Not all sequent assonance, but in any proof, in any deduction, okay? Sequent assonance shall not be empty, okay? Uh, there are linguistic reasons for this. Uh, in Lambeck himself shows the basic example is that you have such linguistically correct phrases as very interesting book that corresponds to this uh, sequence. But now you also, if you don't insist on this non-emptiness, then you can also derive nonsense, like very book. Okay, so the system overgenerates. okay? And what we showed in this paper is the impossibility theorem that you cannot have cut elimination, substitution property, and um, the uh, Lambeck non-emptiness condition and the standard exponential rules of linear logic at the same time. Something has to give, okay? So what to do? Ah, uh, and again, I, I, it's, it's too many things to, but I can just say that the solution lies in light, so-called light linear logic, okay? And this is the system that Girard introduced to type exactly the polynomial time computable functions. And it has add many, many added benefits that uh, it can handle very subtle things, uh, computational things like this Lambic non-emptiness condition. Uh, so instead of the usual rules from linear logic, we're going to take the following introduction rules from light linear logic. We eventually decided to split to add another modality. And uh, it, we, I don't have time to discuss why, but the point is that on the left, we take uh, the cue from Yves Lafont's soft linear logic, okay? Uh, constructed with same purpose to type exactly the polynomial time computable function. And there we have the multiplexing rule instead of contraction, okay? So notice that this uh, sub-exponential disappears when you move up, okay? And instead of having only uh, two Fs, you have any finite number, non-empty finite number of Fs, okay? Um, when you do this, uh, you, uh, so now here comes the uh, Lambic non-emptiness condition again, okay? Um, and the sub-exponential rules for a bang and nabla. Um, the point is that bang, is going to uh, uh, have uh, no contraction, no weakening, no exchange. And uh, NABLA is going to have no weakening and no contraction, but it will have exchange, okay? So um, we now uh, have um, the theorem that this calculus now has all the four properties, all the, the other three properties, it enjoys the admissibility of the cut rule, it uh, satisfies the basic substitution property, and it also satisfies the Lambic condition. Uh, I just, I will close by pointing out that we're at the very edge of disaster, okay? 
if we decided to take a more general rule, which allows the finite list of gammas, like it is in the so-called e exponential linear logic, which is designed to type exactly the uh, elementary functions, okay? Then you lose cut elimination. Oh my goodness, okay? So this thing is very, very subtle. Uh, I wish I had more time to show you all these uh, things. But uh, we're very happy that the, uh, we were able to do this. There is a focus system. There is a pro uh, probability undecidable. This time undecidability is a consequence of focusing because uh, you can, in a focus system, it has clear computational content in that focus proofs are actually Turing machine computations. Actually Turing machine computations. Um, I don't know how to put additives in this same system uh, and keep all the good properties in focusing. So this is, this is tricky, okay? Uh, we would like to understand classical versions of this logical framework, implementation of lazy forms of proof search, et cetera. Um, I just wanted to put up the uh, many, many papers on uh, sub uh, exponentials uh, that, that people have been writing before. And I want to uh, acknowledge everybody's um, uh, input on this. So thank you very much. Uh, sorry to run over a little bit, but uh, here we are. No problem. I think, thank you so much for, for your talk. I mean, it was a very nice, very nice uh, I mean, main talk with all these things. And also for remembering Emilcar on that, I think changed a lot. Yes, Many yes. people that was here, uh, that especially the panelists for sure, and, and many of the attendees as well. So questions, uh, if people have, this is a very nice uh, area. I don't know if there's some questions or not. I mean, I'm, I'm very curious with this uh, Lambeck uh, situation. So Jose has a question, I will guide mine for the end. So Jose, please shoot. Yes, please. So thanks Andre for this very adventurous, adventurous uh, talk, it was really, uh, nice. And so I was uh, puzzled by, I think, your last remark about uh, the connection between focused proofs and the Turing machine. Uh, I don't know if computations or configurations. Could you please uh, elaborate a bit? Thanks. Yes. Um, see, um, the focus proof system, so th there's a there's an encoding which is well, okay, this time the Turing machine is not the, uh, not the uh, uh, Minsky machines. But in the, um, the point of focusing is to uh, kind of present a canonical version of the sequent calculus. Uh, without the focusing, there are just too many non-deterministic steps that you have to do in proof search. And many of them actually don't correspond to uh, computation steps of the Turing machine. So in the focus system, uh, we can show that the sequence, which is obtained by the encoding of the Turing machine, a focused proof of this, of this uh, sequence exactly corresponds to the steps in the computation of the Turing machine. I mean, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, this... Uh, you know, uh, I was there in the uh, PhD defense of Jean-Marc Andreoli in Paris, 1992, when this focusing was presented. And I thought, you know, that's nice, G, you know, very nice. But, I mean, I didn't realize how deep this was. Uh, it's, a, it's really a remarkable thing. You know, when you say sequent calculus, people usually say um, cat elimination which is of course very elementary and very basic. Okay, but now having experienced the power of focusing, I would say focusing is just as basic and important property in this. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so I, I also have a question on this uh, relation with grammar. So I think grammar is very variable from language to language. Is the motivation based more on the English grammar originally? Or, or, or does it try to find some universality on natural language in some way? And, and, okay. or not? Uh, the, um, the, 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 it's true that in the English language, order 
of words matters a lot more than in many other languages. However, uh, the uh, when you hear, you know, I'm not a linguist and I don't pretend to, you know, any claim on, uh, but uh, they, uh, uh, linguists are discussing this as a universal, uh, universal uh, uh, methodology, starting from Chomsky on, right? I mean, people are interested in, in that and the kind of a, inherent internal structure of uh, uh, natural languages, okay? And um, the main, I would say, I think I understand the, the area as much to be able to say the following, that the, currently the main um, problem is to get beyond context-free languages. Um, I would say um, um, the undecidability shows, right? The undecidable actually, with the, you can you can see the proof of undecidability by in this case by saying if you allow all these exponentials and the rules from lightly and logic set, now you can represent any recursively enumerable generated grammar. Okay, so this is way beyond. Okay. However, it's not fair because when you look at the examples, you see that um, uh, the kind of formulas you get are very shallow, okay? And uh, I didn't say during the talk, but here, I mean, we can, if we actually bound the number of Ks in those uh, multiplexing, then such a fragment becomes decidable. And in addition, if we bound the depth of nesting of banks, Okay, which we do seem to have in all the examples, we get NP completeness. Okay, so now the fair question is for this fragment, what is the generated grammar? And uh, that's a great question. I wish I could tell you that. I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay, okay. The aim is to get beyond context free languages. Okay, we, we, I mean, it's no, I mean, this is another spectacular result of Pentas who proved that Lambic. Grammars are uh, context free. Okay. okay, so thank you. I have more questions. I think that there's a closing session that some people might want to go at six. So I was warned to try to keep it below six. And uh, we are on the verge. We have succeeded, yes. We yes. have succeeded. We have succeeded. <laughs> so thank you so much, Andre and Christina and Jose and uh, Daniel for, for, the, for the talks. I think it was kind of the uh, touch of what is done in logic and computation in Portugal and not inside. Yeah. So now in Andre, we went outside of the pool and uh, we went to the, the United States and get some interesting... Thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, it was uh, wonderful to be able to see old friends, at least in this way. <laughs> we all hope... Uh, it was a pleasure. Uh, we pleasure. all hope that we can see each other in person yes. sometimes reasonably the soon. In the, in the near future. Exactly. Yes. 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 Near future. <laughs> yes. We should, we should be optimists. Near, in the near yes. Future. yes. In optimists. Okay. Yes. Okay. Anyway, it's wonderful to see you all. Yes. Bye -bye. Thank you very much for all the talks. Uh, it was really a, a, a great fun to. Uh, Okay, so thank you so much for participating. And I think we've closed the session here. So this is it. Thanks and bye. 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 -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.